Now, guys, when it comes to, again, when, when, it, when it comes to Christmas, right, we're, I want us to don't underestimate that gift that, that I just told you about, all right, that the gift of our attention, whatever you can give God, give it to him, all right, because uh, this series that we're doing is, is, is my gift to you, all right, is my gift to you. This year has not been a typical year, so let's not do a typical Christmas series, which we are focusing on, and I'm not ignoring it, but at the same time, it's not been typical, so let's Let's take a different approach. And so if, if you're watching online or if you're here for the first time, we're doing a series called Worst Year Ever, but really with a question mark, because let's be real. I'm pretty sure some of our grandparents that lived through World War II could have told you, huh, <laughs> I don't know, they, you know. I'm pretty sure others have gone through things that were worse than you. Oh, someone always, have a, you know, always has it worse than anybody else. This would be real. But the, what was so unique, and when I was thinking about Christmas, thinking about this year and evaluating this year, I was looking at some of the similarities because this year has been tough, yes or no? Has this year been tough on people? Has this year been tough on anybody, on you, right? And has it been tough on you? It has been. And if you think about it, that first Christmas, that was tough. That was tough for Mary and Joseph, right? Now, what's unique about this year, which is historic, if you think about it, when has ever in the history of the world, the entire known world gone through the same experience? Think about that. Right? The whole world has gone through the same experience. The only one that I can think of is all the way back in Genesis uh, 3 when Adam and Eve fell. And that was the whole world. It's just two people. So everybody in the world experienced the same thing. But up past that, it's a little hard to pinpoint something maybe. You know, there's a couple of examples in the Bible you could say. But we've all gone through something. And Christmas, if you think about it, it was a tough experience. But it was a unique experience. It was a historic moment that only Mary and Joseph were able to go through, right? It was tough for them. It wasn't easy, right? You know, you, you, we've sung the songs that we sang today. We know that there was no, you know, room in the, you know, room in the, in the inns and all that stuff. We knew it was tough for them. We knew it was tough for Joseph having to be with a woman that uh, got pregnant before they were able to consummate their marriage. And it was not easy for Joseph. It wasn't easy for Mary, right? It wasn't easy for them. They even had a king trying to pursue them and to try to kill them. It wasn't easy for them. It was tough for them. And I think there was something, you know, their tough experience and, and, you know, everything that we've experienced this year about being tough, right? What lesson does that teach us? Now, I, I, online, you got to help me. Uh, online, you're going to write it. Everybody here, you're going to finish my sentence out loud. Ready? I'm pretty sure you've heard this phrase before. When the going gets tough. Okay, y'all got to write a little faster. I know it's easy. They're cheating on, you know, because here they could just say it, right? So, all right, I'm going to give it one more time. You've heard this phrase before. When the going gets tough. The tough get going, right? When the going gets tough, the tough get going. We know that to be true, right? But let's just be real. What happens when the going gets tough and you realize you're not tough enough? Right? What happens when you get to a point that it is just to a point you realize, I am not tough enough for this moment. And the problem is, and here's the thing, guys, if you are not quick enough, if you're not quick enough to find right the, the, kind, of, the right kind of help, at, the, at that time, it's going to get tougher to keep going. And it's going to be easier and easier to throw in the towel. Why bother? I'm done. Right? Have, have we all been there? I've been there. Has anybody been there? Has anybody been there this year felt like just quitting whatever? You know? Maybe not your job because you need that one, right? But maybe some of y'all, y'all know. You, 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 tomorrow morning you're going to wake up and you're going to wish you can quit your job, but you still got to show up to your job, right? You know that. How many of us, I have gone through multiple I'm, I think I'm done, even me, this year. It's tough. When the going gets tough, guys, the, sometimes you realize you're not tough enough. So what do you do? You got to find the right kind of help. And, and so when we look at, again, when we look at Christmas, okay, not just Christmas, when we look at the story, I'm sorry, that we're going to look at right now, because we see that level, we see something Joseph and Mary did that they did when the going was getting tough and they realized they weren't tough enough to deal with all this. But we're also going to look at a different story. We're going to look at one in the book of Hebrews where there was a group of Christians who were going through a situation. They were going through, in essence, self-quarantining and not a pandemic, but persecution. They were going through a lot. And it was times were getting tough. They realized they weren't tough enough and they were going to throw in the towel. And the author of the book of Hebrews writes this letter for one purpose. Don't give up. Don't give up. Not yet. Don't give up on this. No, this is too good to give up on. Don't give up. I know it's tough. I know it's hard. And he pretty much in the letter says, and I know it's not going to get easier still. 
It might get even tougher still, but you got to get your eyes on the right thing, which is, which is crazy. Because I know, um, I don't know, Alicia just talked to me, my wife talked to me, and Jesse talked to me about that boy, Alec, that we were praying for today. And I thought that was interesting. I was like, we're going to pray for somebody for their vision, that they're corrected. And literally, the book of Hebrews was trying to get them to correct their vision, to get their eyes on the right thing. Because if not, it was going to get tougher to get going. And some of y'all been there. I've been there. When things are going so rough, you, you can't even take another step, let alone another breath. You've been there. And so here, what can we do? So he tells them three things in this little section on what to do to help you keep going, but not just keep going, but keep growing. That your life and everything just not, you know, it gets, it can, there's things that can get better even when your circumstances don't get better. And there's something that we can do, and we're going to look at this right now. So we're going to look at the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. So if you're watching, you're reading it online, everybody has it here. Uh, we're going to put it on the screen if you don't have it. We're going to read a good chunk, and so we're going to start with Hebrews 12. We're going to read 1 through 13 first, and then we're going to skip and read the next one. So here's our, here's our text for today. It says, therefore, oh, by the way, let me pause on the therefore, Okay. So, because every time you see a therefore in the Bible, you got to connect it to what was written before. All right, let me just help you with that. So, chapter 11, this guy is going off on saying, listen, you guys know the stories. Look at all of the heroes of the past. Look at all of them. Look at Moses and Abraham and this and, and men and women. This is a New Testament author talking about Old Testament text. By the way, it's written to the Hebrews because these are Jewish people. So he's talking to Jewish people who grew up hearing these stories, who grew up knowing these characters, okay? So there's a lot in this book that's hard to maybe for some of us to process because it was written for Jewish people, but there's still a lot that we can get out of. And so when he says, therefore, he's saying, look, you saw what they did. All of these great, these heroes of the faith, men and women, that God did great things in their life. They did it all. They had one thing in common. They did it all because all they did was believe. They, all they did was have faith. Their eyes were constantly on God. No matter what the circumstances were, no matter this, what was unique about these people. And chapter 11 is called the Hall of Faith. You know, so, you know these big people that did amazing things. And they did it not because their faith was big. It's because their, the, the object of their faith was big. They didn't have big faith like, oh, that's too special. Like, you know, they're different than us. No. The thing was is they didn't have big faith. They just had faith in a big God. That was the difference maker. So here, when he says, therefore, he's talking about those guys. Now we can go back and we return. Here we go. All right, so number 12, number one. Therefore, since we have such a large cloud of witnesses, talking about Old Testament saints, surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run then with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus the source and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that laid before him, Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of God on the throne of God. For consider him, verse 3, for consider him who endured, him being Jesus, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself that you won't grow weary and what? And give up. In struggling against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding blood. Meaning, hey, you guys have, you know, your life hasn't been, or your number hasn't been called to give your life for Jesus. And you have forgotten the, the exhortation that addresses you as sons. He's, he's quoting Proverbs here. My son, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly or lose heart when you are reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he punishes every son he receives. So endure suffering, check this out, as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons and daughters. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, which all receive, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. So if God is not treating you this way, that means he doesn't love you. But because he loves you, he's treating you a different kind of way. He keeps on going. Furthermore, we had human fathers discipline us. And we respected them. Shouldn't we submit even more to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time based on, check it out, what seemed good to them. But he, being God, does it for our benefit. He doesn't do things that seem good. He does things that he knows is good for us so that we can share in his holiness. 
No discipline seems enjoy. This is common sense. No, joy, no discipline seems enjoyable at the time. It feels painful when you're going through it. But later on, however, it yields the fruit, the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. If you've ever been to the gym and been sore, you know the feeling, right? It was like, ugh. Every time you get out of the gym, you feel sore for the next 24 hours. Keep showing up, and you're like, hey, I'm going to deal with the soreness because I'm looking cute. Okay, all right, I'm looking. I'm, I'll deal with the soreness because I'm getting swole. I like it. All right, back. Let me finish. Let me keep going. Anyways, that, that, you guys get it. Therefore, again, when you see a therefore, connected with what was written before. Strengthen your tired hands and your weakened knees and make straight paths for your feet. So that what is lame may not be dislocated, but healed instead. And now we're going to skip over to ver- the end of this chapter, 28 and 29. He says, so therefore, again, read, connect to what was written before. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. By it, we may serve God acceptably with reverence and awe. For God is a consuming fire. All right. So what is all of that? So here's the thing. The first thing, what he's what he's been doing just in that section alone, which is, by the way, at the end of the book. So he's kind of coming down to the big idea, everything he's trying to say. Here's what he's trying to encourage these tired, worn out, you know, people that just want to give up. What is he telling them to do? He's saying when the going gets tough, don't, you know, the tough get going. No, when the going gets tough. Turn to the Son of God. Turn to the love of God. Turn to the grace of God. When the going gets tough, you got to just turn to God. So did you notice in that first one, in the first four sections and verses, he's saying, look, therefore, right, by the way, we don't have that great cloud of witnesses sometimes because I don't know if it's the sports thing in us. Sometimes we think that there's, you know, we're in a stadium of life and here's Moses and everybody all in a stadium. You're like, yeah. Let's get it. Come on, man. On it. Hey, that's not what it means. Okay. That's not what it means. We don't have a celestial stadium and we're all their puppets and they're all eating popcorn, right? Getting, oh, man, he messed up. Oh, my gosh. Why, why'd you do that? Okay. That's not the game. That's not what's happening here. It just means, yo, we got, you look at your past and we have examples to live by. Now, just like you and I, we all have heroes, right? We all have people in our lives that man lived the kind of way that their testimony still speaks to us today. So what he's saying is that, guys, look, look what they did. They, it wasn't easy for them. It wasn't easy for them. But how did they get through it? And how did they get stronger? And how did God do something in their life? All they did was kept their eyes on God, even when it got t- especially when it got tough. When it looked like, I don't know how this is going to work, but I, I'm going to trust you. I don't know how I'm going to get through this, but I'm going to look to you. That's what they did and got through it. And so notice he's in the same way that they did that, guys, we have Jesus to look to. We have Jesus to look to. So when the going gets tough, you got to turn to Jesus. And look, how did he handle, how did he handle tough, you know, a tough moment? And you and I cannot even begin to fathom what he had to experience. An entire life, 33 years, where he went through everything you and I ever went through. He knows what it's like to, I mean, you fill in the blank, he knows what it's like. And here he is, goes through it, and he's on seeing, I'm going through this because I know that in three days when I raise from the dead, I know that now when people are going to believe in me and people are going to be saved and people are going to be, you know, freed from their sins. So I'm not just doing this for me. I'm doing it for everybody else. I see the goal, his, he, the joy of us turning to Jesus and being saved from our sins. That's what got him going. He got through Friday because he was looking to Sunday. You see that where his eyes were. He got through Friday looking to Sunday. So in the same way, listen, because Jesus did that, our eyes should be on him. And so when when he's talking about where we should position our eyes, because for uh, for him to say, put your eyes on Jesus, means you got to take your eyes off of everything else. Means you got to take your eyes off of you, what you can and can't do. You got to take your eyes off of others, right? Even that competing versus other people, right, or just dealing with other people. Take your eyes off of those things and take your eyes even on your circumstances. What about this? I don't know, but hold on, but I know you. That's, it's, it's just going anchoring yourself. That's what he's saying is to turn your eyes to Jesus means you got to turn your eyes away from other stuff. And there's too many of us, right, when we, we, we like to compete versus ourselves, right? We, I don't know, we, we got some competitive people in the house. 
I know, because when I said the thing earlier, when the going gets tough, the competitive ones, the going gets you know, tough, get going. Y'all want to be the first ones to say it out loud, and you said it a little bit out loud, you right? Because I know we got some competitive people like that. And so the thing is that even as Christians, we are not called to compete against one another. We're just called to look to Christ, and that's how we get going. That's how we get through it. And when you put your eyes on the prize, being Jesus, you get a second win. You ever felt that experience, guys? You know what it's like to get a second win? I know maybe in sports, you've, you've been just exhausted, you're tired, and then out of nowhere, you hit, a sec, you hit a gear, you're in the zone, and then you get this level of energy you didn't have before. Some of you guys know that. Maybe you, whether it be in sports, but you know that in life you were just kind of tired, but then just something just gave you that second win, and you just kind of went forward, right? Here's the thing. When you put your eyes on everything else that's not Jesus, it's going gonna, it's gonna to knock the wind out of you. When you put your, literally your eyes on everything else, especially the problem, it's going to knock the wind out of you. And that's a scary feeling. Anybody ever had that happen to you? Happened to me once. I fell off of a jungle gym over at, uh, I think it was Al Lopez Park over here in Tampa, all right? I fell off a jungle gym, landed on my butt, and just in that impact, just all the air came out. And for a minute, I thought I died. I was... I'm like, oh, like, oh no, I'm, I'm dying. I'm, that's it. I'm dead. 12 years old, I'm done, all right, taken out by a jungle gym. That was scary to get that wind knocked out of you. And I know that's what happens to us, right? We get that, you know, we get that, we get fired, boom, wind knocked out of you. Your relationship ain't going the way it's supposed to go, boom, knocked out of you, right? You, you, you got issues with your kids, with your this, with your life, boom, you know, oh, whatever, whatever in your life, knocked out of you, the wind knocked out of you. But when we put our eyes on Jesus, we get that second wind, that third wind, that fourth wind. It's, that, it's the Holy Spirit of God that just blows and breathes into us and allows us to take that next step, that next step, that next step. But you got to put your eyes on Jesus and off of everything else. Notice the other thing, that when you put your eyes on Jesus, then, you know, when the going gets tough, turn to Jesus. But then as you turn to Jesus, you got to turn to the love of God, especially in those tough moments when you can't figure life out. Uh, I, did you guys catch that one, you know, that section where he was saying, listen, sometimes things go bad, and sometimes they go bad for reasons that we know. Like, uh, if, your life is, uh, if your life is like this, mm, you made a stupid choice, right? It's, it's kind of like A, B, it's easy, common sense. That's on you, bro. You got to own up on that. But sometimes these things happen because of the way the world is. And so here when he says, you know, you got to turn to the love of God and you should treat tough moments, difficulties. Treat it like if it was discipline. Don't look at it as like, oh, I have to endure this. No, treat it like it was discipline. Like that it's going to, that then God can allow that moment, that difficulty, that bad medical report, that bad this, that bad that, can turn it into something good where in the end he will improve, you know, improve you. He will make you stronger in him. And so that's that idea, right? And, and I love, notice that what he said is like, guys, haven't we had people, haven't we had people give us tough love before? All right. Have you ever had a coach give you tough love? Be, or have you ever had a parent, a boss, a leader? Lead, true leaders know when it's time to give you tough love. And they give you tough love. Why? Because they want to draw what's good out of you. Right? And they know, I'm going to push you real quick. I mean, we know some people that go too far. Let's just be real. Okay? Some people go too far. And, but that's what I love when he says there. like, look, there's people that have been tough on us, and we respected them. Right? Right? Haven't you, been, haven't you respected somebody that just told you your face what you needed to hear, not what you wanted to hear? You respect them because it came from a place of love. You knew they wanted the best for you, deep down. Right? They wanted the best. They're not trying to live their life through you. Some people do that. Okay? But they wanted what was best for you. And we respect people like that. So how much more should we not respect God? Who humanity, humans, they do what seems right to them. And they mean well. They mean well, but sometimes they don't produce meaningful results. But they mean well. Well, God doesn't just mean well. He knows well and does well. And so if we're able to respect people, respect our parents, you know, respect our coaches, respect those leaders, why would we not respect God? Because we can trust in, that, in the love of God. Again, turn to the love of God. God, I don't love this circumstance that I'm going through, and maybe I can't figure it out in the moment. Again, didn't he say that? I was like, look, when you're in it, it doesn't feel good. It stinks. It's like, ah. It doesn't feel good. And it's okay to own up to that, but then don't forget that God is good. 
Even when your circumstances aren't going good and you don't feel good, you ain't liking this. Never forget that God is good and he still loves you. And he can even use this moment if you surrender it to help you grow closer. Lean on him because he's a good dad. He wants what's best for you. Listen, I have yet in 37 years ever met a parent who when they held their brand new baby boy, baby girl, would hold that baby up and say, I can't wait to ruin your life. I am so excited to take you home and make your life a living hell. Yeah, yeah, I am. Oh, okay. I'm going to cause so much, so much in your life. You're going to need therapy for the rest of your life. Oh, I'm so excited. Yeah, you are. Oh, and you're going to hate every second of it. You're going to hate every second of it. I know. I know. I hate you. I hate you so much. Okay. All right. Have you ever met somebody like that? If, you, if I did, I would, be, I would call 911 and say, I'm turning myself in. I'm going to steal a baby. Okay. I'm not letting that guy take that baby home. No, I'm going to steal. Police, I'm warning you now. I'm, I'm turning myself in. I'm going to steal a baby. I'll explain it later, all right, because you weren't there. You didn't hear the conversation. Look, God's not like that. And, and if we so many times, now I know some of us, when we hold that baby's right, if you've ever had one, you don't mean to ruin their life. You know, everybody wants to do, every parent wants to be a great parent. And you might do your best, and some of you. You tried, okay? Whatever. And, and, and that's per, like, we're all imperfect. That's the thing. No one starts like that, but not everyone ends, you know, where they would like to be. Because we, again, we do things that seem right, seem well, and then sometimes we just don't know what we're doing. That's not God. God's not like that. So when he holds us, he's not going to let something happen to us that is going to just, uh, let me just, let me just, let's kid real quick. All right? Just because. He loves us, and we got to turn. When the going gets tough, turn to Jesus. Turn to the love of God. And then lastly, at the very end, he starts saying, we got to turn to the grace of God, meaning you got to realize you ain't tough enough. I don't care how tough you are, you're not tough enough. You ain't strong enough. you got to allow the, the love of the strength of God to be perfected in your weakness because God is. God is tough enough. Notice that he says, in God, we, we've been given an unshakable kingdom. We read that unshakable like yo this is tough God's kingdom is tough it doesn't matter what happens in the world it could shake violently and still the whole time God's kingdom ain't moving it's not buckling it's not buckling God's promises are tough enough God's promises no matter what wind or storm or or onslaught that God would ever receive God's promises and God's kingdom and what he has his love who he is it's gonna take every single hit and not flinch, just psh, psh, what? That's what it is. His kingdom is tough enough. And that's what we've been given. That's we, we've been given that. And then I notice that at the end I finished. Listen, and God is a consuming fire. That's an interesting one. Well, why, why, why end with that idea? Well, think about it. Sometimes we're, we're talking about suffering. We're talking about like going through it. Sometimes like you're in the fire of whatever your situation is, right? But see, the fire, the consuming fire of God is not to consume you. The consuming fire of God that is in you is not just to ruin your life, to wreck you, it's to remove things, it's to help you, it's to consume the very things that rob you of him so that you can be tested. You guys know that that's how we test gold. We test gold, we test metal. How? By putting it in fire. And when you put gold in the fire, you know what happens? All of the junk and the gook rises to the top. And it has to get so hot that all that fire, all that gold is melted. But it's only in that moment when that gold is completely melted that all of the junk comes to the top and the, the goldsmith and all that, no, he just scoops it all out. Until, you know, when the, the, the master knows when the gold is right and pure, when the master can look at himself, when he looks into the gold and sees his perfect reflection back. That's what God wants. The consuming fire of God. Sometimes things will happen and you're not going to understand, God, I don't get it. But, it, but I'm just going to give this to you. I don't get why I'm going through this. Some things I get it. Okay, I, I was stupid when I was 18, still, still paying for the consequences. I get it. But that's different. All right? Some things we just don't get, but instead give it to God. And he can turn that circumstance around and he can make you look more like him. Okay? So when I think of that consuming fire, I want you to think of iron. Right? Anybody? Who does the ironing in the house? Anybody who likes to iron, who knows how to iron, appreciates, who appreciates a really good crease, 
I mean, you know what I'm saying. You get that good crease. All right? I got to thank, thank Mabel Cotto for helping me appreciate what a good crease is. She knows how to iron. Listen, so I do the ironing at the house. And so here's the thing. Iron, iron is hot, right? That's, that's hot. You've ever been burned? Look, I, I got burn marks still. Like you see, I got marked. That's just been a couple times. A couple times that I've been burned. But here's the thing. When you apply iron to a shirt, you apply all that heat to a shirt, not to ruin it, even though some of y'all, some of y'all ruined some shirts before, you know, okay? But you, when you leave it on too long, right? <clears throat> but listen, when you apply iron to a shirt, are you doing it to ruin the shirt? No, you're doing it to remove the wrinkles. And when you give, when you turn to God during tough times, that hot love of God, when it's applied to your life, it's not applied to ruin you. It's, it's applied to remove all the wrinkles so you end up looking good, looking just like him. You see that? When you give yourself, when you surrender yourself to that love of God. And so here, guys, with this whole thing, as we're looking at a tough year where it's like, yo, I don't know how, I'm, I'm barely just, just poof, 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 making it through the end of the year, and we got to do this all over again come January. What's going on? Listen, I know it, it's hard, but with this, we know that not only can we keep going, but we can keep growing when we consistently turn to God. And this, guys, listen, we can keep not only going and growing. You know why? Because Jesus finished well. Even when things aren't going well, even if they don't go well in 2021, we can still keep going and growing. You know why? Because Jesus finished well. He finished his race. The author was saying, guys, you got to run your race, right? Run your race. And that's the application. Run your race. By the way, your race. I can't run your race and you can't run mine. And I can't run your race for you and you can't run my race for me. You all have something that God has put in front of you, a lane. You got to stay in your lane, right? Everybody just stay in your lane. You got to stay in your lane. You got to be able to run your race. But the only reason you and I can run our race is because Jesus won the race already. It's over. The race is won. The victory has been secured. You and I aren't trying to run this race to save ourselves. We're not. Because Jesus won the race, all we have to do is just, all we do is finish. Maintaining our faith. Being faithful until the end. That is how we run our race. And we don't run it on our own strength. We run it through his. And so how do you run? How, you, you guys want to know right now, man, bro, I, I don't even want to take a step forward, let alone run. I don't like to sweat, okay? I get it. But how do you learn? You know how you run? You know how you learn to run? It's two things, okay? First off, you got to learn to, this is where you start. If you want to learn to run, you got to learn to repent. Notice that what he said at the beginning, he says, hey, run your race and get everything, every little thing in your life that hinders you. Get rid of it. Toss it to the side. Like that's slowing you up. That's slowing you up. If you want to run your race, you got to repent of certain things that you're holding on to, opinions, attitudes, actions, addictions, whatever. Get rid of those things so you can keep running, so you can keep enjoying the life that God has given you. you got to get rid of those things. Right? I mean, I, for, I've seen this, you know, I mean, in, in, uh, mainly in sports, right? You ever have seen a baseball player, right? They, they would put a weight on their bat, and they're in the dugout practicing with a weight on their bat. Why? Because if they're getting really good at swinging a bat with a weight on, I've never seen then the, that same guy go to the plate with the same weight on his bat. When it's time, he takes the weight off because now, boom, he's gonna, his reaction speed is going to be faster you got to take the weight off, right, in the moment. Have you ever seen swimmers? I mean, we got some swimmers in the house, right? And you got some, a lot of swimmers, uh, you know, we got a collection of here. Hey, you ever seen them? They got to, right, wear the, the least amount of clothes as possible. They got to shave everything, right? Because even the little hairs can cause resistance, right, in the water. Even the little hairs can slow you down by a millisecond. So they go as strict strong, okay, removing everything, and what was crazy is that these runners that he was talking about in the book of Hebrews, okay, the, the Greeks here and the Romans during this time 2,000 years ago, you know how they would run their races, their Olympic races? Butt booty naked, okay? That's how they did it. Naked completely because they didn't want anything, not even the clothing to, you know. I'm glad we got some new technology that, you know, we don't got to deal with that. But they would do everything naked because they didn't want nothing to resist you know, they didn't want to, you know, experience wind resistance, and they just wanted to fly. So I'm not giving anybody permission to bust out here and just start streaking down in the middle of I-95 or anything like that. All right, don't do that. I ain't say do that. Don't do that. But to a certain level, we have to be spiritually 
just in front of God, man. He's like, look, I need you to remove this weight because, see, you and I can't remove those weights alone. That's why when we repent, we're turning to Jesus and saying, God, I have an attitude here that needs some adjusting. Can you fix it, please? I, I, got, a, I got a habit here that needs to be removed. Can you help me? By the way, that shows you that you're saved also. When the same sin that didn't phase you before, and now you do it again, and it's like, oh, this bothers me. Why? <gasps> Yo, because you're a new person inside now. There is something that has been awakened in you, and when you see what, what didn't bother you before now bothers you, and what you wanted to be like before, well, when you, what you didn't want to be like before, now you want to be like, meaning like God-like, that's because God has done something in you. And God is just trying to highlight and say, yeah, you got to still, hey, hey, give me that. Uh, you're saved, I know, but that's where the repentance starts. When you repent in Jesus Christ, the biggest weight goes off of your shoulder. And that's the weight of sin and death and hell. The biggest chain that's on us is that. And when you turn to Jesus, instantly that chain is removed. Instantly he removes that weight off of you. And so what we got to try to do from there on out is stop tripping on the chains that are broken by your feet. Because that's what happens. Jesus breaks all these chains. The thing is, sometimes we go sit back down and, camera guy, can you follow me? Okay, we kind of sit back down and we, we play. Okay, all right, we play with the same chains that Jesus broke. We play with those. We pick them back up and now, oh, but I, I, I'm, I'm, this is harder to run because you're, you're holding all of these things that Jesus already handled. Instead of just saying, Okay, I'm going to give it to you. And now you get to experience life. That's what he wants. That's how we can walk with God when we're not just holding on to the same excuses, holding on to the same opinions. We're giving it to him. That's what repentance means. But then the other one is this. Ready? If you want to learn to run and give your best, you have to learn to rest on the promises of God. If God said it, trust it, and apply it. And he has shown himself to be faithful. He has shown and proved himself to be good. The crucifixion and the resurrection is all the evidence I need to give you. That's it. And when you learn to repent and rest in the promises of God, you're going to run. And you're going to experience the joy of God in your life like never before. But you got to remember this, though. The whole point of it is, Okay, when you rest in the promises of God, I told you, when the going gets tough, what you got to do, not the tough don't get going. No, 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 you, you, you turn to God. Knowing that he is enough, you're not. You're never, you can never be tough enough. And the goal is for you to not to be self-sustaining, well, God, I got this now. No, it's constantly being a place, Lord, I need you to get me. And I, I got a little video, can you put it on? There's no audio to this, so just keep the lights on. I want you to see this. Some of you have maybe heard the story of Derek Redmond. In the 1992 Olympics, uh, Redmond was playing, and he, the year before, 1988, he got hurt right before his race. And so he spent four years dedicated to get ready to run 1992 for Great Britain, running, I think it's the 400, yeah, 400 meter dash. And he was giving it his all. This was four years in the making. He got hurt previously the year before that. And so he was spent four years looking up, and at that very moment, you just saw there his hamstring snaps. Four years of working for just 40 seconds of his life. His hamstring completely shatters in that moment. But yet, he's not going to take it lying down. He gets back up, and he's going to he's, he's try to finish this race. Carries him the rest of the way. He couldn't do it. Derek, there was no way to finish this. It, was, it hurt too much. And because Derek leaned on his father, his father helped him to finish the race. He carried him the remaining distance. He said, look, leave me, bro. That, that's God with us. Sometimes, right, God, we're trying to lean on God, and then excuses be coming our way. And God's been like, hey, you need, to, you need to get out of here. You need to get out of here. That's God with us, trying to remove all those things. When all he wants us to do is not just to finish. And God, look look what I can do. Look what I can do. No, no, no. He's just saying, look what I've done. I Look what I've done. All he wants us to do is do that, is to trust in him and to know that we have a loving father, and he will carry us the rest of the way. All right, camera guy, back you this way. Listen, that's it. That's how we run this race. That is how we run this race. It's not about looking pretty. It's about recognizing every single flaw and area that you need and saying, God, I need you. It's not about finishing this race to be better than you or better than anyone else. Jesus won it all. All we have to do is finish. 
All we have to do is finish and persevere. And we have a God, a heavenly Father, who is there to carry us the rest of the way. So if you've ever, if you're finding yourself tired, like, I, I'm, I'm done, I've been done. Maybe, maybe you've been done years ago. Maybe this wasn't the year. This was just, you, you've had your own version of 2020, and this lasted maybe a decade or two. Listen, God sees it, he knows. Don't fight him. He's running alongside of you, just wanting you to lean on him so he can carry you. Don't fight him. Don't fight him. You don't got to prove anything to him. Jesus has proved everything for you. He's proved himself. You don't have to prove yourself. God proved himself. All you have to do is lean on him. Your sins, your, your worries, your concerns, your, even your doubts, so just give it all. Rest on him. Even Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said an open invitation. He says, come to me, all you who are laboring and you're tired, you're heavy burdened. It's too tough for you. I get it. It's too much for you. I know. So come to me and I will give you rest. For my yoke upon you is lean. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Listen, if you've never, if you don't know what it's like to find that rest in Jesus Christ for your soul, you're going to be forever restless. Restless forever. You know, disappointed with yourself, disappointed with everybody else, instead of knowing what it's like to just fully throw yourself into the loving arms of your Heavenly Father. And that's why I said if you want to learn to run, you got to first repent. Turn to God. Just lean on Him. Trust in him. He is good enough, not you. You give him all those things. Lean on him. And then for the rest of us, when you have, then keep going. Paul in Galatians was telling him, hey, you guys were running well at first. What happened? They took their eyes off of Jesus. There was a church that was doing, they were running well. They took their eyes off of Jesus. Maybe some of you are Christians. And maybe, hey, this year you took your eyes off of Jesus and put it on something else. Put it on your problem. Put it on your circumstance. I don't know. And maybe you were running well and no, you're no longer running well. It's okay. Jesus finished well. So all we have to do is to get back up. For even the scripture says that the righteous is not someone who falls down, that who doesn't fall down. A righteous person is someone who gets up again and again and again. And we don't get up on our own. It is our heavenly father that picks us up when we keep turning to him. And he makes things right in us because he is righteous. He is righteous and he wants to make things right in us. That's how we're called. Imagine, guys, if you could walk out of here and you can run like Derek did, leaning on your father. Imagine if we all, instead of just trying to limp through life, we're all leaning on our father, running up and encouraging each other. When you see one of your brothers and sisters limping, you run up to them and you, hey, no, no, no. Come on now. Come on. Come on. All doing it together. That's, that's, what we're, that's how we're called to live. That's how we're called to live. So listen, if this year taught us anything, if this year taught you anything, it's a couple of things. Number one, this world is shakable. Number one, if you haven't learned that this year, 2020, this world is shakable. Look at what a pandemic, I don't care if you think it's fake or real, the world was shaken this year. But you know what? God's kingdom is not shaken. His principles are not shaken. He is not shaken, never shook. That's him. It's different. And so I want to encourage you, if you feel like you're in a tough spot or the going is getting tough, the tough don't get going. When the going gets tough, trust in Jesus. That's it. Lean on him. Lean on your heavenly father. And you are going to find a rest for your soul that will last for all of eternity. You're going to find a rest for your soul that's going to last for all of eternity when you rest in the promises of God and in his finished work. He run the race. He ran his race, finished. All he wants us to do is trust in him and keep running, keep turning. And he will bring us across the finish line if you do.